let me uh, talk a little bit about what the aims were of this work. So we wanted to look at, first of all, what were the, the, the vocational experiences of adults on, uh, with autism spectrum disorder, as well as that of their, their family members or, or, or caregivers if they were involved. And, uh, and we also wanted to look at the experiences of job supporters or those who uh, were in somehow involved if, if we could locate them. And, uh, and, and then we wanted to look at the service providers and the experience of, of, of those organizations and w a bit of where, where are we at in this area. And really to look at what are the, the barriers and what might be some pathways to vocational success. Uh, so let's talk a little bit more about that. But let's, let's talk about where we've come from. So we, we did a survey that we sent out to organizations that provide vocational support across the country. And we were really relying largely on networks and uh, finding those organizations in the country have been a challenge. Because there is not one central repository, and I think that's a problem, because if we can't find those organizations, how do we know what they're doing and how well they're serving, what, what is their process, how consistent or inconsistent they are, what are the, the regional variations and issues and so forth. So that, that is one challenge and we've, we've, we've had to dig to find those organizations. So far we have 94 across the country organizations that have responded to this and they tend to be individuals uh, at a fairly high level in the organization. Uh, they might be sort of program leads or s someone like that in terms of providing vocational services. And, and in brackets, that refers to how many from BC specifically. So 12 are, are from BC. In terms of key informant interviews, so those are interviews with individuals with ASD, parents or caregivers, service providers, and employers. You see the numbers there, and again in brackets are the BC numbers. And then at the bottom of the screen is, is in a sense what we're doing tonight, which we've called the Delphi, and really it's about sharing information and getting a sense from you, does this resonate with what's going on here in BC and what are some of the issues and priorities in moving forward? So let's talk a bit about who was a part of this, this uh, survey in particular. Um, and, and let's start with, in, in terms of the mix of urban, small urban, and rural. So large urban was 100,000 plus. Small urban was anywhere between 10,000 and 100,000. So that's a wide variation. And rural was under 10. And, and so uh, here in BC, largely we were split between the, the large urban communities and, and small urban. Now, I think the proviso is some of those smaller urban communities are fairly close in proximity. So they might be um, within the lower mainland, but they're a distinct community, but, but accessible to, to Vancouver. This slide speaks to the number of individuals that are served by the, these organizations. And, and we've just here put on the BC slides, just to give you a flavor of this. Remember that these are small numbers, but this isn't inconsistent with with the other numbers across the country. And, and the point I wanted to make was, um, in a given year, how few individuals actually are served per organization. So um, the, the majority here are 11 to 25 and 26 to 50 individuals that receive service from, from an organization. So when we think about the, the numbers of individuals that, that could benefit from vocational resources relative to that which is being received. These data, although not representative of, of the broader picture, but certainly across the country, give a, a, a glimpse, a portrait of a very underserved resource, or under, a, a population that is not getting s sufficient services that, that uh, are, are, are addressing uh, services for the, the bulk. Is that surprising to people here? Okay. So I think the message is we've got some ways to go. Hey? This, this, this is probably the busiest of graph type of slides and then we'll move on from here. But I, I wanted to just raise this in particular and it's, it's interesting to me 
because when we think about autism, we think of it often as a, a developmental disability or a, a, a developmental issue. It's in a category called, we label it autism or autism spectrum disorder. But actually what we see here in the, in the most subscribed areas, so we, what we asked uh, service providers to do was to, to identify where they were, what kind of organization they provided, what kind of services they provided. And the most subscribed are assistance for individuals with ASD to obtain employment, which makes sense because those were the groups that we were targeting. So we, we were identifying the right groups. Um, uh, assistance for those sort of obtaining and, and retaining, important distinction, obtaining and retaining. Keep that in mind, we'll come back to that, employment. And then vocational services for persons with ASD and for individuals with other disabilities. And what we found across, certainly BC, but across the country, is that the service providers are not autism specific, but rather are, are, are providing services across disability groups. And the question emerges in varying degrees across organizations. What is the understanding or the sensibilities, the sensitivity to the issues specific to autism? And we, we found a, a, a substantial variation, um, but a real sway to uh, capacity building needs in terms of organizations, particularly in, in adult populations and, and thinking about what are the unique developmental needs, certainly vocational needs, and, and broader needs in terms of sort of wrap around what are the resources that could benefit someone in vocation that may not be called vocation. It might be services related to mental health or services related to transportation or other things that we haven't really thought about as important uh, in, in terms of a, a, a useful service. Just quickly want to give you a sense of who these organizations were. I'll just read some of them here. Industry, provincial government, so again, very few organizations, but non-governmental organizations, university affiliated center, advocacy organization or society, service agency, and then we had nine organizations that identified themselves as other so I wanted to give you a sense of who those were, because that's a big number in terms of the, the, the number of organizations. And the, so these are uh, listed as nonprofit advocacy information service, an employment support agency, an agency providing occupational education in specific areas of occupation, um, nonprofit society contracted with Work BC to provide employment services. Uh, an agency providing employment support for competitive employment, uh, helping obtain employment, so a real variety. I'll just go through them. A nonprofit organization facilitating post-secondary inclusion for individuals with developmental disabilities, and a corporation uh, providing services to adults uh, with uh, intellectual and functional disabilities. And lastly, an employment program for people who are transitioning from high school to post-secondary uh, education or, or workplace. So, so a fair variety, but you know, very much focused on vocational issues. And so this survey asked this question. How well are vocational services of the organization planned and evaluated? Really what that gets is, is how well does that organization orchestrate services and uh, provide, have, have an evaluation framework, have a, a theoretical frame that's with clarity, that, those kind of questions. So there was, there was questions that fit within that domain. Okay, that was one area. The second was looking at the organizational capacity. So how well is the organization able to meet the vocational needs of individuals with, with autism spectrum disorder? Now, the proviso, and it's an important proviso here, was organizations were asked, how well do you do what you do within the confines of the resources that you have? That's an important distinction in terms of that question. Um, so that's really looking at the question of effectiveness of the organization. And the next one was um, enhancing system capacity, which was there was a set of questions that asked, how well does, does each organization do in supporting the broader system of services to adults on the autism spectrum? So not just, not, not thinking in a, in a narrow siloed way of vocation only. There, there, there may be broader issues, often are, that, that need to be addressed 
and uh, so the question is uh, how well are we contributing to that work that dialogue being part of that community and then there was one last kind of domain of questions which was about community c capacity and in, th in this set of questions we turned the dime a little bit and we weren't asking so much about the organization specifically but more about the community in which the organization was embedded and it was, the question was sort of how well does the region or municipality meet the vocational needs of individuals on the autism spectrum? So let me show you the BC results here. So just in a nutshell, in a very crude way, looking at these tables. So this was the first. Remember, this was how well, sort of how orchestrated, how well developed are the services in terms of planning and evaluation. Um, how clear in mandate, those kind of questions. And we collapsed agree and strongly agree and disagree and strongly agree. So that it, in terms of the positive, it's service planning and evaluation are, are, are done effectively. That's kind of the, the gist of, of this table. And as you look, the majority agree with that category. That, that, that they have a base that's relatively strong. When we asked about enhancing system com capacity, same kind of thing. The majority agreed or strongly agreed that, um, that, that the system's capacity in that organization was there. And, and similarly, when we talked about organizational capacity. So, um, that, sorry, organization was the, the organization addressing needs, effectively addressing needs. And, and that enhancing systems was um, building capacity, contributing capacity in the larger system and community. Where we saw a difference was in this last. Look at the, the difference here. So this is, if you can't see at the back, that's disagree. And, and it's about community capacity. So the majority of organizations felt like as an organization, they were, uh, were, were doing fairly well in addressing the need. But that as a community, we were falling short, which my, we can interpret that in different ways. My, my take on that is this is, to me, a better proxy in some ways because it's less personal. It's, about, it's less about how I'm doing in terms of my practice or my organization, but rather about what the state of the services are in, in the community. And so that's, to me, that's a, a concerning uh, issue. To me, it's also a bit concerning the difference in terms of how how an organization is, is the sense of, of, of its, its operations versus what is going on more broadly. But that could be that a recognition that there is just not the capacity in the system to address the, the volume and nature of need. I, I just wanted to put this on. This is the national data. I won't go through this, but it's the same tables. And as you can see, if we flip back and forth, it's the almost identical pattern. So with with so BC is is similar in terms of what we're seeing and in, in terms of the, the where the state of vocational issues uh, in terms of being there to to open up opportunities for individuals with autism and or not meeting capacity. Okay, so let's move on to some of the interviews. So I wanted to to focus a little bit on uh, the individuals that were interviewed for the study with autism. And here I've used more, our, our, our numbers more broadly uh, just because I wanted to be more representative. The numbers, when we break it down by, by region and province, they become so small. So, so here's just a, a, a sense of the mix. So uh, uh, about 70% male to 30% female in terms of this, the sample, the people that participated in the study. The age range ranged from uh, the young, young adults were the majority, just over 50%, uh, so 18 to 25 year olds, uh, and about 30% that were 26 to 40 years old. So these were individuals with, on the autism spectrum. And then uh, a smaller number, 14% were aged 41 to 65 years. And uh, the, the, uh, about four-fifths, exactly four-fifths, were uh, in urban centers. And, uh, and a range in terms of, of diagnosis, drawing on, um, on the, the dsm four, the earlier criteria uh, of, of an autism diagnosis. There was, there was a range in terms of English as a first language, although uh, I have to say it was difficult to 
identify, harder to identify individuals or find individuals where English was second language and or uh, uh, that might have other areas of challenge or, or marginalization in their life, like uh, low income or, or the, some, some of those issues, uh, it was harder to find those individuals. And our suspicion is that our concern is, or the question is, are they able to access, are, they, are, they, are the resources reaching them to the same extent? And, uh, and, and the other thing was to participate in a study like this takes time and sometimes having to go to a location. And so there's, there's challenges that uh, sometimes with, it, it requires resources to make that happen. So I, I, I get concerned that all voices or the spectrum of voices may not be represented. So keep that in mind. But we tried to have some diversity in, in who we were speaking to. This is a, a, uh, uh, an income table. And at the top, what we did was just break down um, the incomes by under 20,000, 20 to 39, 40 to 59, 60 to 79, 80 to 99, and then 100,000 plus. So it's annual income. And we looked at the, the, the income of individuals on the spectrum, many that were living un, un, with an annual income under 20,000, versus at the other end of the spectrum, families that... Uh, had an income that was at, at, at the at the other end. Now, keep in mind, there was in families there are more often more people earning income. But when you think about the cost of living in Vancouver or other areas of the country, um, the the issues of living on an income of twenty thousand speaks to the varying degrees of financial dependence on families and, and, and what that means in terms of if people are not getting resources and are not giving entry into what reasonably paying positions and job security and so forth. So keep that in mind as we move forward. So here's a few wor quotes from individuals, things that individuals had to say. So this is a young man who says, I haven't had a chance to figure out what my vocation is. My life hasn't let me up to this point. And we heard things like that that spoke to, along the way, in childhood and adolescence, individuals talked about being very focused on what are the needs in the moment. So what are the needs to build functional capacity? What are the needs to get resources? Um, families that are working diligently to get the resources that are needed now. And, and this individual spoke to, in, in, in the flurry of that busyness, not thinking about what that future would look like and how, what, that would, uh, what would that take to plan or to think about the resource base and so forth. And we, we heard those, that nature of, of, of perceptions. Here's another one. The problem is I can do the job well, but I get anxious on the job because I'm comparing myself to other people and I'm analyzing. I don't do the job like other people. I see the power dynamics and the way it treats people and it gets to me, you know, because I'm passionate about the job and I don't like it when other people are not passionate about their jobs. It's horrible. I hate it. And this individual talked about, as others did, talked about the, the experience of of being in a job and being aware of some of the inequities within the job setting and, and the challenges in terms of work and um, kind of a spiral downward as, as some of those issues were not dealt with justly and, uh, and how that led to uh, leaving a job and then each, for, for many, leaving that job became it that much harder to get back into the next job. And so it, 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 I think it, it challenges us to think about how do we create opportunities for success that we can build on success. So let's first talk about some of the challenges. Is that all right? Because they're very real. And these, these emerged along categories or domains. And uh, uh, first of all, um, emotional and psychological challenges. So those are things like anxiety. Anxiety in the workplace was a big issue. And it was, was sometimes an issue already, but it was made that much greater by some of the issues and demands in the workplace. Um, issues of mental health 
uh, concerns and challenges that in, in, in some, some cases were not being well dealt with in many cases. And the, the, the collage of those issues coming together and trying to sort that out and how that fits within, within the, sometimes the, the, the pressured uh, environment of the workplace. Lack of self-confidence. Sometimes what we heard was lack of self-confidence that reflected um, years of messaging uh, that was 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 hurtful, or or and 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 also issues that happened in the workplace um, that didn't go well. That the person took on themselves as I did it again, and took that on very personally as that that was their struggle. Um, rather than thinking about it, it, it may be a broader issue, or you know. So, I think that challenges us to, again to think about how can we turn that in a different way. And then you put that together with other issues, but certainly, certainly those issues lead, um, don't do anything for someone's self-esteem. And uh, people talked about the, some of those very real challenges and how that those created barriers. In, in often the pressure cooker called the workplace. And then there was other issues related to focus and concentration. So here's, here's an example. Uh, a parent said this. He, referring to uh, their, their adult child with, on the autism spectrum, he can't think about doing four things at once. He can focus on one. And then this, this mother went on to say, and he does that one extremely well, fastidiously well. But, but the workplace demands that kind of juggling, that multitasking that became challenging. Um, and, and another was uh, an individual who studied for hours and saw patterns but struggled to remember. So there was this splintered presentation of, uh, of skills and challenges and uh, I, I think it behooves us to think about what are vocational fits that work rather than trying to pigeonhole people into places that don't work. Okay, environmental or processing challenges. So sensory issues were, were, was a big challenge in the workplace. Is that any surprise? Um, and our workplaces are... are often not set up well in terms of sensory issues. So the din of the lights, the, the, some of the, the modern design, the kind of pod structures, you know, where we, we're kind of in, all in these kind of communal spaces. And so if, we're, if I'm hearing somebody breathe beside me and that's distracting and, you know, and all, all the issues of, of sensory that, that can, you know, across the spectrum, the variation is, is substantial. Um, verbal details. So a lot is is conveyed in the workplace in terms of just rapid fire of verbal, with, without um, detailed. So, sometimes people said if it could be in writing, if I could have the sheet to refer to. Uh, so those are some examples, and and then insufficient time to to process the tasks, or the emotions in terms of. Um, just the, the onslaught of, of things coming at one in the workplace. And, and, and think of the, just the sensory challenges and, and without time to kind of processing that and, and collecting oneself to move on to the, the next challenge. And often there was just a lack of time for that. And then and another set of challenges were, were these issues of social and relational issues. So... Um, and, and so much of the workplace is relationship-based, isn't it? So issues of, of interacting with colleagues and supervisors. What we heard was some who got it and many that did not. Um, others uh, are, are, are in the workplace that were not direct. And people talked about the challenge of this subtext where we don't say what we mean. And, um, you know, it's a virtue to be honest, isn't it? But they talk, <laughs> they talked about, though, in the workplace, things are said and not said uh, that don't reflect honesty, but this kind of undercurrent of, of information and, and how difficult for some that can be. And, and so they, they, they were um, given labels like, you're too honest. 
That's a good. That's a good thing to say, isn't it? But it was used in a way that wasn't. The message wasn't intended as 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 saying that is a, is a good quality. And blunt, honest communication was misinterpreted. And they talked about that. That's not just in. Um, verbal communication but other forms of communication so telephone but also online I've been thinking about that as we th- and looking at emails and how we do our emails and I don't know about you but I often will will have in an email in varying degrees and some will all be different here but there'll be a line like how are you but really not writing that email to ask how are you we're asking with a specific purpose but that's the preface to the message and some that we spoke to said I don't, I don't get all that silly nicety stuff let's get to the point of why we're writing that email but then they were penalized for that directness and then eye contact was a challenge and where that was particularly a challenge uh, not, not only but particularly most commonly was in in um, areas of hospitality or retail services often dealing with the public and um, where there was an expectation of this sociability and that may be a real challenge for some folks on the autism spectrum and and, and an issue there is sometimes those are entry positions into the workforce right and so I, I wonder if we need to think about entrees into the workforce that render success remember that issue of the downward cycle if it doesn't go well it makes it that much harder to go for the next possibility and and, and so to, to find those early wins early, early successes is so critical and then that notion of again difficulty with strangers and you know in, in those re, in the retail sector service sector other sectors we do a lot of work with strangers then some other issues unrelated to what we just talked about. More, more uh, issues like, like physical or biological issues. So I, I think that we tend not to talk about the, the, uh, enough about the impact of ongoing sleep deprivation and how that prepares us or not to be on our game in the workforce or, or for that matter in, in school or post-secondary education. Um, issues of, of attention and challenges in that area. Um, logistical issues that, that we, we really think about. It's not a vocational issue. Right? I mentioned this earlier, but issues of, of travel and uh, transportation. So the ability to use public transport and the wait times. A huge issue when we think about smaller communities without public transport systems. But, it, but in the city too, in terms of just safety and challenges around uh, transportation, other issues that, that we might not think of. But I, I think it calls us to think about vocation and other issues in autism in adulthood, as we would do in children, I hope, to think about them broadly and how they intersect to lead to broad-based success. Market issues. So um, in, uh, it's been an interesting journey to kind of look at the country around vocational issues because all, size, all sizes don't fit all uh, in, in many ways. We hear that notion in autism, but, but it's also in vocation because the economies in different regions are different and call for, I think, different sensitivities around how we respond to that. So there are regions where there are less plenteous jobs and that becomes a challenge in terms of the, the competitive market for jobs. But in markets where the economy is really strong, often it's strong around a given sector. So I come from, from uh, Alberta, where the oil and gas sector is particularly has been quite strong over the last uh, years. But there is, in some of those areas, this sort of natural funneling to say, why don't you get a job there? There's a good paying job in that community that often is distant from may be distant, may or may not be distant from where the, the supports are and some of the other, and, and so there's kind of a, a, a natural gravitating to what's available which again may not fit and, and not lead to ultimate success. So I think we need to balance some of those issues. And then, and then the issue of job structure and demands. I've touched on this but the tasks are 
are, are the onslaught of tasks become too great without time to recuperate. So we, we heard stories of people going at the end of the day and kind of going and decompensating, whatever that looked like. And then before they could f- feel like they could pull themselves together, we're back at it the next morning or the, the next shift. And, um, and, and, and that, that just became, for, for some, just became overwhelming in terms of, of success and, 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 and stability in that, in that position. And, and I think we need to think about what, what are the, the ways of supporting someone to modulate some of those stresses. And, and there are some really wonderful feedback, or I think critical feedback around how we organize the work and workplaces and in some ways the way we think about commerce, I mean commerce very broadly in our, in our communities and society. And it comes to this point at the bottom, you can't have meaningless rules that muddle up my mind. Now, how many of those type of, of, of notions emerge without a, a good thought process, kind of a guide to manage that muddle? to explain it. And I, and, I, and I wonder if we could do a better job to set it up so someone expects some of those things and has a, this is probably the wrong word, but a rule book or a guide book to manage those variations and tensions and those muddlers in, in the workplace, those challenges that, that uh, we, we face in, in every workday. Let me switch gears and talk about elements of success so what lent to uh, outcomes that were much more favorable? So first of all, in the orange, we talk about relationship formation with employers. Relationship matters. That's what we found consistently across the, the country. That, um, you know, we think of the, the, the trajectory of a job. I apply for a job. I fill in a form. I go for an interview. Now think about the steps of that. I need to look at the individual, I need to have some small talk, I need to have this sociability going on, I need to find places of connection, I have to convey in there that I know something that's of value to the employer. So that job interview was, was often a stumbling block right at the front end. Not always, but sometimes. But what seemed to circumvent and help that process was relationship. Relationship. And I'm not so sure that is as unlike the experience in for, for many others who are not on the autism spectrum. When you think of how people get a summer job, I don't know what it was like for you, but I think back of early days when I would I'd be listening for someone who knew somebody who was looking for somebody and it would, that connection was happening, that, that relationship. And that relationship formation emerged as really important. But it also happened, it was important on the job. So that fami- familiarity with the supervisor and the employer had an understanding, a, some degree of sensibility about autism and autism in the workplace. And... Um, we might say, well, how would that come to be? Often it was sometimes through, through personal connections. But my dream is that we, we have systems in place that, that build capacity so that's not so unusual. And we think about the, the awareness of autism, but it's really thinking about that, that really focused um, awareness of autism in a really positive, constructive way and, and, and how to create that in the work setting. The, the, the next point here is an ex- external navigator or an advocate. So we've just talked about the employer, but, but a, a person that often made that happen and complemented what we just said was that person. Now, there was varying names to that. It was that supportive other. Some people said a job coach. Some people had different verbiage. Um, but the, the, um, uh, one of the keys was that in in the employment, at the front end, the employer was open to that support person being involved in some some education, some process around working systems well. That seemed to be a a critical one. Not for all, but for many. 
um, and follow up between the job coach and the employer. So not just a one-off, but a meaningful support. Uh, and, and, and I think in varying degrees across the country, that's a struggle. As, as services can be... Uh, I, 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 I'm concerned that we don't look at this too simplistically, but look at it in a, in a, in a more meaningful way and over time. But look at areas of, of feasibility and, and, and where we can maybe find partnering and, and, and to make it more feasible and, and, and efficient. Um, and individualized and regular support. So what I mean by that is support that really is tailored to the individual, their uh, strengths, the challenges, and um, and then some intervals and in following that. So there was off, there was different variations. Some people were involved for a fair degree at the front end, and then that support weaned over time. Um, some it was fairly intermittent, intermittent, excuse me. But the point was that it wasn't just sort of a single occasion, but there was some order to that, and it fit. It, it was tailored to that individual and 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 to to what they what they they needed to to move forward and to make it work for them. Along that line was this notion of when when hiccups came along the way, and people talked about crises or challenges that um, for some ended up shutting things down in terms of that op employment opportunity but what we learned was it didn't need to and um, one of the keys was that that job coach there was there was quick accessibility back into the workplace or within that workplace to navigate that and, and, and kind of work around that to, to move forward so that role seemed to be critical and then um, intervention to or support to both the, the individual with ASD and to the employer. So we sometimes think about a job coach as the job coach for the individual with autism, but actually um, some of the work in, in being present in the work site is so critical. I, I wonder actually if that's where the change you know, when we think about attitudinal changes and creating welcoming spaces. That happens in the organization and amongst the people there. Uh, in terms of the individual, there were strategies and skills to develop, um, not just job skills relative to that person, but social skills, life skills. I, you know, it was a real range, but it was, uh, uh, you know, things that so much in the workplace that happens isn't just about the work. And so thinking over the breadth of that and, and how we need to manage that. Um, finding time, working out workplaces and spaces and time so that the, 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 the tasks, the day could be structured in a way that allowed the individual to, to process. And that might be the emotions, the sensory demands, etc. And then for some, vi vi visual triggers to facilitate memory, scripted role play was described. So having an opportunity to practice, um, to, to, to work out some of the kind of the, the typical scenarios in the workplace and um, thinking about what would a guidebook look like to, to um, support one in managing that setting. And then clarity. So much of what we do is on the fly and that's a lack of clarity and process. And, uh, and so tasks aren't well broken down and we're just, it's subsumed that we would just move forward in that and for some that, that becomes particularly challenging but it doesn't need to be that way. So finding that, those places of structure. Some things that brought stability. Stability of employment. Stability of employment is important, isn't it? Because to move into a job and then to lose that job can be a demoralizing experience. So stability. So here is a few that emerged. Um, remuneration uh, and incentives. And um, I think of, the, of your word I've learned from here. Real work for real pay, right? Um, consistency of job experience. Um, so again, it speaks to the predictability as much as possible. Or the guidance around the, the, the lack of predictability and how to navigate that. What are the systems to deal with that? Um, an employer that is open, that is nimble to make those adjustments. Um, again, that importance of person, people in the employment kind of getting that and realizing the, the potential 
huge benefit that can come by opening up space for the richness of diversity. And, and we heard many stories of the, the honesty and integrity and fastidiousness of individuals with autism in the role. And when that happened, along with the right fit, good things came. Here's, a, here's an important one. Effective, sensitive, so very real support, but non-patronizing support in the workplace. Really critical. Um, optimizing success. And part of this... I've reframed this, really, it, the, the negative of that, of that is this notion that when, so, when something happens, when there's a mistake made, that it closes the book on this. But rather this notion of challenges will come. I, I, don't, I haven't been in a job where I haven't made mistakes, right? I've, I think that we all share that. But that didn't mean the end of my job. And... Uh, nor should it for anyone, right? And, and so, but, but setting that up, optimizing success and planning that, thinking that from the front end, and, and recognition for the value, the very real value of contribution, which, which we heard many examples of, of value, not in terms of, not just in terms of effective work done, but the, the building of um, a sense of a community in the workplace that was much stronger and as, as we, heard, we heard wonderful stories from colleagues especially sometimes from employers but it was often the colleagues that said you wouldn't, you wouldn't get what a difference that person has made in our organization you know what I'm talking about? the richness the, the intangible benefit to an organization I don't think we tell those stories enough Workplace environment. So there's a big issue in terms of what, some things we need to work on. And I'm going to move through these slides quickly in the interest of time. And I've tried to pack this in with content. And I'm sorry if it's dense, but I wanted to get as much as I could here. Um, so positions, we've talked about this. Finding positions that are a good fit. So they fit the skills, the aptitudes. And that is about many things. So let's break that down a little bit. It's uh, consistent with the interests of the individual. Now, it might not be their number one interest. They might have an interest that is hard to, to, to fit into an employment scenario, although sometimes I wonder if it's our lack of ingenuity. I don't know. Something to think about. But, but fit with interest as much as possible or, or a synergy to some degree and, and commensurate with skills and strengths. Um, so, so supporting the individual to work from their, from their skills, from their strengths, rather than um, a focus on let's put someone in a place where they are working to overcome their limitations. There may be work to do to, to, to deal with the challenges, but the overriding um, place, chat, place in terms of employment is that notion of fit. Uh, it, it is the strength side, the positive side. That, that came through quite loud and clear. And so the balance there is, is reaching to the skills or complementing the skills or pushing the bar on the skills. So finding those places of resonance and pushing those and generally avoiding the areas of challenge or uh, are working on those. But, but do you see the point there? It's on finding the synergies related to the strengths. So the notion of person-centeredness. Now we hear about this in, in, in other, other realms and in, I think of in, in pediatrics we talk about uh, person and family-centeredness. And I think the notion of person-centeredness, which thinking about how that overlays with the, the corporate agenda or the company agenda or the, the workplace agenda, but thinking about how they can work together. And um, we saw wonderful examples where there was complement, complementarity, but it was often uh, around thinking about the package in terms of people have an understanding of autism and wanting to be corporate citizens but also realizing they wanted a workplace that was successful and bringing those, those discourses together in meaningful ways. Clear, achievable job expectations. So again, we're getting at specificity. Attention to detail. So jobs that are just so vague without supervisory meaningful support or, or, or input about clarity and, and uh, follow-up. Those When that, that 
neg sort of that um, non-specificity became a real challenge. Active communi- communication, so that notion of checking in. So an engaged, supportive supervisor really became a critical notion. <laughs> Opportunity for skill development. Now, isn't that an issue for us all? I mean, think many of these points fit for any organization. Opportunity to, to build skills. Opportunity to grow. Awareness of potential sensory concerns. And, and not so much just putting them under the table, but actually saying, what are some solutions? We heard some wonderful, sometimes simple, practical solutions, but it was somebody who paid attention. Um, a calm atmosphere emerged as important. And, um, and so sometimes that was about where that individual's workstation was, or, or you know, thinking about tempering environments to, to make them less frantic. Um, and mutual understanding and respect for involvement and support. So um, that really gets at support for the individual on the autism spectrum, support for the supervisor, and support back and forth. So that mutuality, uh, thinking about this as a, as a community working towards success for all, for that organization, for the individuals therein. And, and, and I would add for a community and families, so a critical issue. And and I'm encouraged that 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 we we saw instances of this where it happened well. We've got a long way to go, clearly. Workplace preparedness. So let's let's start early on. Supportive involvement of HR management. Um, some knowledge about autism and autism in the workplace. Um, so having that, that preface of information and the, the job coach, some of the skills that we've talked about. I'm going to skip some slides. I put a lot, as I said, I put a lot of content in here because I wanted you to have that and I, I, I didn't think we'd get through it all. But can I move forward because I want to get to something that um, we talk about the job, some roles of the job coach. I want to talk about the role of parents. And the, I, I want to pay tribute to the incredible role of parents and families as they navigate this complex world. And um, I, it was interesting as we saw innovation and um, really good options in the workplace. One of the things that um, often wasn't too far in the background was a mother, often a mother, sometimes a father, who had done some hard work to make that happen and navigation. And um, Yet parents also described be- feeling very tired and, you know, in varying degrees. So the, the thinking was, what would it take to have services that would augment that work? And um, the challenge is, in the workplace, the employer is not often as interested in engaging with a family member. So we need to think about meaningful services. Um, Here's just a few quotes from parents speaking to the challenges. I dreamt just before he left high school, I dreamt he died because it's like you die as a human being in terms of the services that are available or programs or anything. That's a very strong statement speaking about the, the, the sheer lack of services that we've seen across the country relative to the need. There's some, there's, there are services, but boy, relative to the need... We've got a long way to go. The parents are always the people driving it because they're the people who have to live with it, I guess. And lastly, it involves so much creativity and imagination and courage as a family to look at how can I integrate my child into the community we live in. So well done to the parents. But let's think about what would it take to have systems that were in place. So systems issues, just to sum up here, overall lack of, of services, varying transition support. We saw a huge mix, but probably favoring less transition support generally across the country. Um, issue, particularly challenging issues for people living in poverty or isolated populations. Um, support organizations. One of the issues was a, a lack of information, but also confusing as to what agency offers what and who's eligible for services. So a morass of of information and how to wade through that. Um, There's a lack of balance generally, a lack of preparation services relative to 
I'm sorry, there's more job preparation, so resume writing relative to the, the real work of job placement and job retention, job services, finding and keeping a job. So we've got some work to do there in that area. And there was debates going on among groups and people's thinking around incentives to employers, what, you know, to think about how to navigate the market or not and what that means. And lastly, um, support versus um, that sense of being valued in the workplace and what that meant and, and um, kind of grappling with those very issues. So it was really thinking about support, but also the re very real value that the individual brought. So this is where I wanted to get to in, in finishing up, and that is we spent most of our time uh, talking about some of the issues for the individual. And it, those issues of tailored individual support are so critical. And they are job preparation, certainly at the front end, job skills, life skills, but also job access fit. We've spent a lot of time talking about that. And, and job retention. So things in the workplace, relationships, structures that make it work over time. And, and, and fixes when things go awry, which they may. Um, so that's the, the job, ta the tailored, uh, the, the individual support. But in the workplace, I don't think we put as much attention here. So, so building workplace capacity. So finding opportunities. So we've had examples where people have been prepared to work gone through services, and then they can't find placement or lasting placement in terms of a job. And so building that surge capacity at the employer level, workplace accommodations, so thinking more diligently about what would it take to create success in the workplace, and associated supports uh, such as, uh, you know, here's some examples, mental health, housing, transportation. So those are, those are community issues. And... Um, Let's go to some of the structural programmatic issues. So service availability and being able to navigate those services, the coordination, and, 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 and getting the information that individuals and families need to get those services. And family, family support, honoring the role of family in this and thinking about what are models that would work for families. Uh, fa families were often the ones, as I talked about, that really worked to make that work. And how, how do we think about that in new ways? It, it's, it's easier when, ch when people are younger, that, that role of family just veers in easier. But how do we think about that in adults? And, uh, and so the notion of augmenting but easing the family role, really critical. Thank you for your attention to these important issues.